You know, it occurred to me almost immediately after uploading the last episode that I believe the phrase I used was happy winter festivities. Of course, it's only winter in the Northern Hemisphere right now. It's amazing how easy it is to forget how seasons work. So, happy summer festivities to everyone in the Southern Hemisphere, and also happy new year to everyone. Or actually, I guess I should say happy new solar year. Because if you're using a lunar calendar, the new year isn't until later, I think. Anyway, the point is, I'm recording this video on New Year's Day of the Gregorian calendar. And therefore, I would like to wish to all of my patrons, and everyone else watching, a very happy and pleasant 2022. May it be blessed and bountiful for everyone. Now, to pick up where we left off. So, after the last episode, I ran a whole bunch of tests with various different phonological forms to try and find something that I liked for negation. And I went on quite a journey, as you will soon see, because I was forced to make a decision that I'm still not 100% certain that I'm going to go for. Well, okay, first of all, for the negative affix, you may recall that I already tried using a root that began with a Y for the negative, and I dismissed it almost immediately, because as it seemed to me, that would almost inevitably give us a final Yai syllable, which I hated, so I discounted the idea and moved on. But then, much later, it occurred to me, when I went back to look at it again, that's not actually the case. Because with vowel loss, that Y would actually, more often than not, come into contact with a palatal stop. The palatal stop, since it's in a cluster, will turn into an R. And that, in most cases, will give us a stem of the form Aira, which I personally absolutely adore. That just completely nails the phonesthetic that I'm going for. Like, naira is just such a nice word for I am not. And then with the long stem, I confess I fudged it a little bit, because I really wanted to end up with a front rounded vowel there. So what I basically said was that even though the stress should be on that long R, since you're negating it, you're placing a little bit more emphasis on the negative element. So I had that U just take over the whole syllable. Feels a little bit contrived, but... I mean, I can see that happening. And then we got these forms out the other end, plus if we factor in the suppletion in the singulars, we get these, which I also really, really like. So this U word for the negative has turned out to be a smashing success, and that also means that the negative prefix that you apply to converbs will be either Y or y, depending on the vowels in the stem and what vowel harmony is doing. And then for the other auxiliary, for the suppletive forms, I just came up with this root ku. Pretty simple, I think it worked out okay. Nothing amazing. You see in the long stem, most of the time that just results in a geminate k. But now, here is the issue that I grappled with. You'll recall that the original idea was to have suppletion for the more common form because I liked the idea of the negative auxiliaries not really resembling the affirmative auxiliaries. So the suppletion was going to happen for the standard copula, which is what gives rise to forms 1 and 2, which are on average used more often, because they're for really common tenses like the present, the perfect, and the imperfect, whereas forms 3 and 4 are for like the future and the conditional and slightly less commonly used forms. So that was the plan, but... I actually like these forms so much that I want them to be as common as possible. So I'd really like them to be the auxiliaries for form 1 and 2. The only problem is that these are based off of the akya stem, which is the locative copula, which essentially by definition gives rise to forms 3 and 4. And so, and this is the bit that I grappled with for ages, what I ultimately ended up deciding to do was to switch the forms for the copulas. <laughs> so it used to be that Han was the standard copula and Akya was the locative copula. I have now switched those, just so I can get those nice sounding negative forms more often. And so having done that, these are what our final forms look like. It does feel a little bit petty. That's not the right word, but you know what I mean. Like completely switching around two verbs just to get a nicer sound. 
But fortunately, we're still in the fairly early stages, so that didn't have very many knock-on effects. The only real thing that I needed to change was this possessive... I actually don't even know what to call it. This possessive relativized verb? It's almost like an inflecting adposition at this point. Anyway, whatever it is, this possessive word, if you remember, it originally came from the locative copula with an applicative to mean something like to exist with. So if you wanted to say, like, my hand, you would say the hand that I exist with. But now that we've changed the locative copula from akya to han, that means I had to change these forms as well. And I came up with this other form for the applicative that I just liked slightly better. And I think that's the only thing I have to change if I'm going to switch around those phonological forms. I really hope I'm not overlooking something, and that now that I've swapped those two around, the entire language is just going to collapse. But I trust you all to point that out to me in the comments. And the only other issues I had were that I'm not a huge fan of the fact that for a lot of these, if we compare form 1 in the affirmative versus the negative, a lot of them do look identical except for a ra ending. I don't like how transparent that looks. It looks like there's just a ra suffix that's conveying the negative. Which, hilariously, isn't actually what's happening at all, but just through funky sound changes, that's what it looks like. But I like that ira ending so much that I think I'm, I'm willing to put up with that. And another small disappointment, my three favorite sounding forms are Nivan, Sivan, and Arhan. And those three used to be in form 1 and 2, which means they would have been used fairly frequently, but now they've been kind of demoted, if you like, to forms 3 and 4, so they're going to see less use. Which is a bit sad, but at the same time, all three of these forms are, I don't want to say heavy, because they're not, but they are, at the very least, disyllabic. And I get the feeling that if they were forms 1 and 2, if they were really used that often, they might get crunched down further, like that nidan, I could very see that just getting crunched down to just nan with a long A. But I feel like putting them in forms 3 and 4, if they're used slightly less often, that means they won't have been quite as reduced phonologically, so we can justify having slightly longer forms. Because like that arhan, if that was form 1, then that would mean they are, for the present, habitual, and perfect, which get used all the time. And arhan is kind of a, not clunky, but like overly long word for that. I could very easily see that being reduced to like arhan. But keeping it as just a future thing, I don't know, I think it's just slightly more justifiable that that H would linger. So again, barring any disastrous, unforeseen consequences, I think I am going to stick with this. And also, one actual little bonus to come out of this, you remember last time I was trying to think of lexical sources for the suppletive verb? Well, now that it's the locative copula that's undergoing the suppletion, and remember we said that lack is an extremely common and intuitive verb to use for a negative existential meaning, so that means I can just go ahead and say that this ku form means to lack, or at least meant to lack. I don't know if it's going to stick around into the modern language or not. I've noted here that it might have a meaning of to want, or become the verb that means to want, which is a pretty common thing that happens in a lot of languages. Because you can see how that happens. If you say, I lack something, the implication is that since you don't have it, you want it. And it also seems fairly likely to me that that same verb root would give rise to a postposition that means something like without or in the absence of. Which again, I think that's pretty obvious how that happens. I go lack you is I go without you. But also, this cool coincidental thing happened that I'd like to explore further at some point. Probably not just yet, but if you remember the word we were using for prohibitives was this verb that means to remove or to take away, and I just came up with this random form for it. Actually, it was originally kiru. Man, that voiced pharyngeal is hard. But then I realized that that actually violates the language's phonotactics, because very soon after the protolang, there's an allophonic thing where all instances of K before I become palatalized, and then the palatal stop does a bunch of other stuff, and would ultimately, in this instance, I believe, 
end up turning into an S, which we could do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But the way I temporarily fixed it was just to reverse the vowels to turn it into Kuri. And that is when I realized we've got this Ku form that means to lack. And now we have Kuri, which means to remove or take away or to make absent. And I didn't plan for this at all. But looking at these two forms, could it be that this I ending is actually a causative? Because with those meanings and those forms, that just fits so perfectly. I kind of just want to lean into that. I don't know, I'm going to come back to that, but I can't believe how perfectly that worked out. And of course, if need be, later we can just adjust this form slightly. Like that voiced pharyngeal doesn't have to be a voiced pharyngeal as long as it gets lost between the two vowels. And one of those vowels could be long. I don't know, there's a bunch of different ways we could make variations of it to find a suitable causative ending. Anyway, for the time being, that then is negation finished. So just to give you an idea of how it works, and also just for fun, because we didn't do this in the last episode, but let's try out some example sentences. So first of all, let's make an affirmative sentence. Oh, by the way, I also finished the forms for the mihinno word that means bird, and I decided that in the plural, the T from the original classifier becomes a D, because I like how that separates that from the nuria form. So it'll just be a thing that nouns that ended with a nasal in the protolang spontaneously develop a D. Actually, it also occurred to me that if we use han for the locative copula, then these would be the converbs for it. And therefore, if we add the mi that I'm using as an applicative to generate a meaning of to exist with, then these principal parts do seem kind of similar to mihunne, the word for bird. Which means if you wanted to say being with a bird, or coexisting with a bird, or being alongside a bird, then that would be translated as mihinnin mihunnus which I just find kind of amusing. It's always fun to find potential puns and wordplay in a language you're making. Anyway, now that that tangent is over and done with, back to example sentences. So what tenses haven't we used yet? For no particular reason, let's just go with the near future. And let's just stick with to love as our basic test verb. So let's go with the birds will soon love the rock, because of course they will. So the first word is the subject, so we take the nominative plural, mihunnis. Then comes the auxiliary, which for the near future is form 3. Form 3 in the affirmative for animate plural is tisan. And then the rock in the singular accusative. And then the first principal part of the lexical verb, which is murin. So mihunnis tisan irnusse murin. The birds will soon love the rock. So then, how do you negate that? Well, there are two options. Number one, you can take that same phrase and just swap out the auxiliary for its negative version. So the negative of tisan is tiruk, so mihunnis tiruk irnusse murin, which I think would be the more common, the sort of default way of saying it. But the alternative is if you want to specifically negate the semantic content of the converb, then you can do exactly the same as the affirmative sentence, except you put a u prefix on the converb, which I guess a sort of fakey way to translate that in English would be something like, the birds will soon not love the rock. I mean, it doesn't come across very clearly, but essentially, if you negate the converb, you're saying, the birds will soon not love the rock, but hate the rock, or whatever other verb you want to use. You're saying that an action is still happening soon, but it's not loving, it's something else. Whereas using the negative auxiliary would just have a much more general meaning of negating the entire clause. So, I am pleased with this. And so with that, I think we are officially done with negation. Right, so now that that's done, I think we're all set to just crack on with some more verb morphology. Because I think I really would like to sort out these valency changing operations sooner rather than later. Because in my mind, they're going to be pretty essential when it comes to both derivational stuff and also 
with the way this language handles its syntax. And in particular, the detransitive, the sort of all-in-one turn a transitive into an intransitive, and the exact meaning is just left up to case marking, and the applicatives, those two in particular are going to be indispensable in helping to shuffle around and reorganize the information within a sentence. And also for derivational stuff as well, because I'm imagining these applicatives being used kind of like the way that prepositions are sometimes used in English. Just like, off the top of my head, um, the difference between to know something and to know of something. No, that's not a good example. Um, well, actually, one example that I was going to touch on a bit further down the line. In English, we have the word sick or to be sick. But to say to be sick of something means to not like it or to be tired of it, which is kind of similar to what Nawat does, because in Nawat you have a word kokoa, which means to be sick. But then if you apply the applicative to that, you get kokolia, which means to hate. It's literally to be sick towards something, in pretty much the same way as to be sick of in English. So I'm imagining these applicatives will be used for a ton of derivational purposes like that. Now the thing is, since these applicatives I think will often be paired with this detransitive, I'd like it so that when the two of them occur together, they don't take up very much space, or I guess ideally that the combination of the two is only ever one syllable. Because I don't like the idea of every single time we want to change around the order of the sentence and make something new with the topic, that we have to attach two entire separate prefixes onto the verb. I'd like them to be very small, if possible, and to sort of fit together seamlessly. So you can see I was already thinking about some ideas for phonological forms. We've got that me prefix in there tentatively. I still need to work out exactly where that comes from. So first of all, establishing the order that they come in. We're going to have the verb stem, which will always be in converb form. And then I believe I said for the detransitive, I was thinking of deriving that through noun incorporation, of just having a word that means like head or face get incorporated straight into the verb, which is a pretty common source for reflexives and other such things. Because that's the key. It starts out just as a reflexive. In the protolang, it's a reflexive. But it's because of the fact that with the other passive, this indefinite, impersonal thing, with that you cannot restate the agent. So if you do want to restate the agent, the speaker started using the reflexive, and then the reflexive drifted into a sort of middle voice, medio passive type thing, and then it took on all these other meanings afterwards. So the initial lexical source would have to give rise to a reflexive meaning, so something like head or face seems like a pretty likely candidate. That's very common. And since it's noun incorporation, Generally, with noun incorporation, since it's being compounded directly to the verb stem to form a new lexical meaning, the incorporated element will usually occur right next to the stem. So it will be the detransitive affix immediately before the verb stem, and then the applicatives, which come from all the postpositions, will be just be stuck at the beginning of that. So with the detransitive, then, I think one way of making things efficient would be to have the detransitive end in a coda consonant. And if we assume that the applicatives are going to, for the most part, be just simple CV forms, then the vowels would just blend together and result in only one syllable. So for the sake of argument, if we did say that the detransitive was just an, then adding the committative on top of that, that would blend together into either min or man. If we made it am, then that m, if it came before a vowel initial word, would stay as an m, but if the stem began with a consonant, then the nasal would assimilate, which gives us a little bit of variety. But then with the S, that S would turn into an R between vowels. And also, if we are going with this me prefix, then that would give us either mom or meme, which are okay. But I think I prefer mis or mas. So, okay, I'm leaning towards this one now. So if we tentatively go with that, one interesting question is, if we had a root like etan, for example... Then with the detransitive, it would be asitan. And we've said that the detransitive came about in the protolang. So then with sound changes, we have vowel loss between voiceless segments. So it would become astan. So that initial I 
or for any stem that began with a vowel followed by a single voiceless sound, then the initial vowel would just get deleted. Which again is actually quite nice because it saves us precious syllables. Because if we threw an applicative on top of that, then that means we can add two extra pieces of grammatical information without changing the syllable count at all. That would be ideal. Okay, that's cool, but then it does occur to me that if this is a noun being incorporated into the verb, does the noun have a gender marker on it? Or was this actually incorporated before the classifiers became mandatory? In fact, what classifier would that have? It's head. And that opens up a whole other question of what class do body parts go into? My immediate thought is probably animate, but maybe if you're specifically talking about a human body part, then it goes in the human class. I think animate is probably the most likely, so if we just stick with that, the animate ending is a glue, which that voiced uvula disappears, but not before turning the u into an o, which by the way, in the protolang, s is not a valid coda, so there would have to be some vowel after that. But even if it had a class ending on it, I don't think that would affect much. It might result in a long vowel, but mm, I don't know. In either case, I think we could just justify saying that even if there was a vowel there, it was lost. It does feel a little bit cleaner to just say this happened before the classifiers became mandatory. Because after all, we are saying this was back in the protolang, this was already an established thing. So let's just say originally there was a vowel at the end, let's just say it was an I. Oh, actually, again, if it was an I, then it would palatalize the vowel that comes before it. Which isn't a big deal because the palatal S just turns into a regular S later on anyway. And then I'm conscious of the fact that I'm using a lot of vowel initial roots, and we have no shortage of sounds in the protolang that just drop to nothing. So if it was something like rasi, and maybe with a class suffix on it, maybe? Because in that case, once the voiced uvula disappears, the I and the now O would just turn into an I anyway. Okay, going with that for the time being. For the applicatives, again, the applicatives ultimately come from postpositions, which themselves ultimately came from verbs. So for this tentative committative, that came from with, which maybe came from take. Maybe. So for the benefactive, it seems pretty uncontroversial to say it came from for. And by the way, I'm still not completely sure that we're going to have all of these. I might ditch the ablative, I don't know. Or I might even include some more as we go as well. Most languages, if they have applicatives, will have like one or two, maybe three. But there are some languages, like I believe Ubich, and I think Ainu as well, that have like nine. So who knows? The specific meanings aren't important at this point. I'm just trying to generate some forms for them. So four could come from a verb that means give. Again, that's pretty common. The instrumental could come from with, but with in the sense of by means of if those are actually distinguished in this language. Because a lot of languages conflate the instrumental and the committative, like in English, where we can use with for either meaning. So maybe the instrumental and the committative are actually the same applicative, but if not, and we do have a separate postposition that means by means of, use seems like a pretty obvious choice. And then for the locative, we could use something like to, or maybe at, or towards. So something like go, potentially. And the ablative will obviously be from, which could come from something like leave. Okay, great. Now we just need some forms for them. So we've established that, like with this me prefix, these things already existed in the protolang as postpositions, and they were bereft of any additional morphology. Okay, well just thinking of some candidates just on the spot, something like do for to give. Oh, Actually, wait, brainwave. So if this does come from give, another thing that to give sometimes gives rise to is a causative. So if we went with the idea up here and said that ri is actually the causative suffix, and if the causative was derived from to give, then maybe, just maybe, that same root could give rise to a benefactive applicative. Because if it's a causative, then it'll be used as a suffix because it will be an auxiliary verb in that case, which in the protolang comes afterwards. But as an independent word, it becomes an adposition and then ultimately a prefix. That's very sneaky. I have no idea if that's going to work out as perfectly as I hope, 
but that would be absolutely awesome if it could happen. Now, if that were the case, then combining it with the word for head, how would that reduce down? Well, the I would drop to an E after the pharyngeal, the pharyngeal would disappear, as would the velar fricative, leaving behind an air. And according to our combos, air goes to ya. So it would ultimately become yas, which is okay. My only cause for concern is that the negative is the y prefix. So if we wanted to negate both of those, then depending on what the vowel harmony was doing, then it would be yuyus, or yuyus, or yuyas, which isn't great, but we might be able to fudge it a little bit. We might be able to reduce them together or change the vowel or something, maybe. Like, maybe we could say without the negative, it's yas, but in the negative, it's yus. Like, maybe the extra y raises the vowel. Yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that's workable, so we'll come back to that. What was the other form I wrote down earlier? Was it do? I think it was do, and then maybe ba. Again, I'm just sort of coming up with these just based on my phonetic references. It occurs to me at least one of these should have a long vowel. Let's just make it do for now, because long vowels do exist in the protolang. But actually, let's give the other one a long vowel too, but a long vowel that came along later. Something like he, because there is a global stop in the protolang, I keep forgetting that. But if we say that's there, oh wait, actually, let's say a he, so then the velar fricative can get reduced to a plain H. So based on those protoforms, we end up with these. Actually, I like that one slightly better. I'm going to put it higher up, just to signify that it's higher priority. Well, if I'm not mistaken, for each of those, with the detransitive afterwards, it would just be a case of adding an S, or an R if there was a following voiced segment. And then if there was a negative prefix on top of that, then for these two, those voiced stops would become fricatives, so that would become va and thu, or I guess the or the, depending on the vowel harmony. Okay, well, I think that actually might be all we really need to do with those for now. So I guess to just sort of see them in practice, and to iron out some of the details, how about another example sentence? Well, the first question is, what verb are we going to use? Because it has to be a verb that would make sense to have an applicative attached to it. I mean, I guess some of these verbs could work, but I think this is a perfect opportunity to come up with a new verb. So what comes to mind is a pretty basic verb that would make sense to have an applicative and a passive or detransitive meaning to it, to hit or to strike. Because with an instrumental applicative on that, that would be like to hit using whatever the object is. I singled these ones out because I liked these forms as postpositions. And since postpositions ultimately come from verbs, I try to reverse engineer verb forms for them. To hit is a pretty basic meaning. I think I'm going to go with this one. Except, again, I am conscious of having a lot of these roots beginning with vowels. So, why have I got these principal parts in the wrong order? So I want this root to begin with a consonant. Maybe let's have it begin with a z. I feel like I haven't used that very much yet. So, zaki. That's a good word for to hit. Now, of course, the z is going to turn into a r. Now, that does mean that the third principal part is rarak, which I don't like the repetition of the ra syllable. Which, by the way, I forgot to mention that with this verb, to love, I changed the second principal part. It used to be murur, but I just decided that, since it's a pretty common verb, we can permit a little bit of irregularity. And so I just sort of said that blended together into one syllable, so it's just mur. So we could do the same thing here and say that rarak just becomes rak. That's not too much of a stretch. Maybe I'll implement another sound change that's like proper haplology, like some sort of robust change that gets rid of all these duplicated syllables. I don't know, I'm not going to resort to that just yet. But if we say that does drop out to just rak, and use that as our word for to hit. Now... Let's say we wanted to say, I hit the cow with a rock, which I do not condone, by the way. I do not advocate hitting cows with rocks. In fact, actually, yes, I did not hit the cow with a rock. There we go. So first of all, I think that would just be the perfect tense. 
and the perfect is form 1 of the auxiliary combined with the third principal part. So form 1 of the auxiliary in the first person singular would be either nai or naira. Let's go with naira for now, just because it sounds so nice. And since it's a pronominal subject, then naira will be the first word in the sentence. Then we have the third principal part of the verb, which is rak. But now we're using the applicative because we're saying hit with. It's not very easy to translate this into English. A closer way of translating it would be something like, I did not hit with a rock by the cow. So since we're using an applicative construction, the rock is actually the direct object, and the cow will just be in an adpositional phrase. So the converb needs to take the instrumental applicative, because it's hitting with the rock, so it takes the he prefix, but then that needs to be preceded by the direct object, which is rock. So rock in the singular accusative, and then the cow in the prepositional phrase. Now the prepositional phrase will be part of the converb clause, right? Because it's like, I am not, while hitting with a rock to the cow. So yes, it'll be after the auxiliary and before the direct object. And then I don't know what case the cow would be in, or if it would need an adposition to sort of help along the meaning. I'm going to go with the dative for now, but that's one of the things I'm going to have to iron out pretty soon. Okay, so I think it would be naira nurior inusahirak, which word for word is I am not to a cow a rock having hit with. Okay, and of course the other way of saying it, if you want to specifically negate the converb, you can just use the u prefix. But now, here comes the clincher. How do you say? There's no easy way to translate this in English, but it's essentially, I did not hit the cow with something. So essentially, we're cutting out the direct object, which in this case is the rock. So it's like, I did not hit with to the cow. Well, it's the same sentence, except now we use the detransitive which would ordinarily just be adding an S before the verb stem. So in that case, the only way to tell that the verb has been detransitivized is just by paying attention to that geminate R, which I think is okay. After all, in English, we detransitivize verbs by doing nothing. Like you can say, I see the dog, and it's transitive, or you can just say, I see, and just cut off the direct object, and there you go. You have detransitivized it which, as far as I'm aware, is pretty strange cross-linguistically. Most languages will make a very sharp divide between what's transitive and what's intransitive. And if it's transitive, it has to have an object, always. Unless you use some valency-changing operation to detransitivize it, of course. Okay, and I see now that we have a little bit of an issue. We had said that for a passive interpretation, the agent would be placed in the dative, which is what we've placed the cow in. So actually, no, according to what we have so far, this sentence would mean, I was not hit with something by the cow. By placing the cow in the dative, it has now become the agent. That's not what we're trying to say. Also, I left the word rock in there. Ignore that. It would just be, nai nurior yuhirak. So if that's, I was not hit with something by the cow, in the dative, I did not hit the cow with something, where the cow is still the not-quite-direct object, the sort of adpositional object. You know, I had just provisionally said that the antipassive would involve the genitive, which is actually the accusative. But thinking about it now, I actually think that in this instance, the genitive makes sense. Because if you remember, converb clauses derive from possessive phrases. I am from the head-hitting of the cow. So actually that would be nurius in the genitive. So you see how just with a very simple case alternation we end up with two completely different meanings. So then with the antipassive, is it still the genitive? Okay, well, if we take this one and say we want to reintroduce the direct object, which in this case is the instrument, which is the rock, if it's in the genitive, then we won't know whether the cow or the rock is the direct object. So that could either mean I didn't hit the cow with a rock, or I didn't hit the rock with a cow. So I think to clarify that ambiguity, I think we would have to use a different case. 
and we can't use the dative because that's the case of the agent, because if we did that and put the rock in the dative, that would mean, actually, I'm not even sure that would work. So if you take out the cow, that means I was not hit with something by the rock. So if we can't use the dative or the genitive, the only other option is the locative, which for inanimate is the same as the nominative anyway. So that would be, I am not having hit with something of the cow to the rock, which would be interpreted as something like, I did not hit the cow with something with general regards to the rock. So like you're reintroducing the rock as the thing that was hit with, but you're de-emphasizing it. I think we might need to introduce some ad positions, maybe, to help things along and clarify stuff. Okay, so Bib from the future here, coming back in time to give you an important update. So I recorded this video yesterday, and it was a fun time, you know, we've got our detransitive, and we've got our applicatives, we've got phonological forms for them, and they fit together very nicely, and I spent a while making all of these example sentences, but as I was editing the episode, and as I was thinking more about this system and trying to wrap my head around how it works, the more I realized that there's a little bit of an issue that we have to deal with. So let's just stick with our simple example sentence of, I hit the cow with a rock. We'll ignore the negative just for the sake of simplicity. So the thing that occurred to me is that the order in which the valency changing operations are applied to the verb will change the overall meaning of the clause. Because let's say we apply the detransitive first. The detransitive removes the direct object. So now we get a meaning of I hit something, we don't care what it is, with a rock. Where with a rock is still a prepositional or I suppose ad positional phrase. And if we only apply the applicative after the detransitive, if you're following me, then all that really does is change the case roles. So instead of with a rock as an ad positional phrase, we now have rock in the accusative. However, if we do it the other way around, then that promotes the rock to being the direct object, and the cow is shunted off into an ad positional phrase. And if we then detransitivize that, the detransitive removes the direct object, which is the rock here, so we get something along the lines of, I hit with something by the cow, or I guess, I used something to hit the cow. So you'll notice that these two not only result in very different meanings, with a different argument being omitted by the detransitive between them, but also in this one, if we apply the detransitive first, then applying an applicative would retransitivize it, whereas with this one applying the detransitive afterwards reduces its valency back to being intransitive again. So that's a pretty massive difference in meaning, which means that we need to decide which valency changing operation has precedence over the other. So I was ruminating on this for a while, and I came up with this, which I think is every possible combination of applicative and detransitive, and I threw the impersonal in there just to see if that affected anything. And in this case, the applicative is applied first, and in these ones, the detransitive is applied first. And you'll see that with these ones, in these two cases, adding the applicative doesn't actually result in a change of meaning, just in which case markers are used. And it also means, I think, if we went with this one, that any verb that has an applicative on it can't be passivized. Let's say we had a verb like to fight, and then we put an instrumental applicative on that verb, which would give a meaning of to use to fight, or to fight with, or perhaps you could translate it as to wield. Now if we took that and then apply the detransitive, we would get a verb that means either to wield something, intransitively, or to be wielded, depending on what the case marking was doing in the rest of the clause. But if we applied the detransitive first, then we initially get a verb that means to fight something, or to be fought. That would give a meaning of to fight something with, or to be fought with. So the sort of semantic implications of the applicative are completely different, and we don't get this nice single word that means to wield. So this is all to say that upon all this consideration, it seems to me very important that we apply the applicative first to the verb, and then the detransitive. Now what that actually means in practice 
is that I think that the applicatives would actually be more semantically tied to the root. And generally, if that's the case, the greater semantic influence an affix has to the root, the closer to the root it will appear in the template of whatever the word class is. So whereas here, I had gone ahead with the assumption that the detransitive would immediately precede the stem, because it derived from noun incorporation, and noun incorporation tends to stick pretty close to the root, I actually now think it's more likely that the applicatives would come next to the root. Which is kind of a shame, because that completely invalidates basically everything I've been doing in this episode so far, but I don't think that should be too much of a problem. And as for why add positions would appear closer to the verb stem than noun incorporation, I mean, we said these applicatives evolved very early on in the language's history, but it occurs to me that they could have got affixed on before they actually became realized as add positions. They could have still been verbs at the time, and ended up being interpreted as a sort of serial verb construction. So to hit with, for example, could literally be to use hit. It's a shame, because I did really like the template of having these different prefixes with this coda s coming in. If someone knows more about morphophonology, or can think of just some justifiable way that I could keep this set up and it would still make sense, then please do let me know. I'm going to keep this here for the time being, but just really quickly, I wanted to just draft some more potential forms, just so that this part of the episode hasn't been a complete waste of time. So the annoying thing is that now, every single time we use this detransitive, which I imagine will be fairly frequently, the verb is always going to take the same prefix. So we're going to be seeing this prefix a lot, whereas before the applicatives would sort of help disguise it a bit more. For now, let's just go with something simple like ta. So once again, I'd like the combo of the detransitive with the applicatives to take up only one syllable if possible. But in order to do that, that means that these applicatives have to be vowel initial. And I can't possibly justify all of them being vowel initial. Actually, with the committative, if we are sticking with the me prefix, since I already used that for the possessive word, then I think the vast majority of the time that I would be lost, and that M would come up against the initial consonant of the stem. Unless the stem began with a resonant, because vowels are never lost between resonants. Okay, that's not bad. And if we go with a re-causative idea, then that should fit pretty easily into a single syllable. It would just add either a glide or just change the vowel quality slightly. So yeah, that should still be good. Actually, this is turning out to be easier than I thought. Well, I might as well reuse this AS prefix while I'm at it. I guess I could just take advantage of all of the protoconsonants that ultimately just disappear, or I could get away with saying that the combo of the detransitive with the applicatives happens often enough that there's additional phonological reduction, so we could have the consonant of the applicative disappear when the detransitive is applied. I don't know, I'd prefer not to, but... Oh well. I'm gonna go away and think about that off-air, because I think this episode is already long enough as it is. Alright, with that out of the way, now we can return to our regularly scheduled programming. I'm running a little bit long, but I think we've got time to coin one last noun. And I guess the obvious choice in terms of class is human, since we only have one of those so far. And we already have woman. I am eventually going to need just a generic word for person or human, but I don't want to do that just yet, because I think that's fairly likely to have some irregular stuff going on. Maybe something like child could work. And that will be useful because when we eventually get around to making some adjectives, child seems like a pretty likely source for a word that means young, or even new, or something like that. Now this root for woman ended in a vowel, so we want to go for something that ends in a consonant this time, which by the rules of the protolang has to be a resonant. In fact, why aren't I arranging these in terms of stem phonology? There we go, much better. So this signifies whether in the protolang the stem ended in a short vowel, a long vowel, a nasal, or a liquid, and that'll just help us keep track of what's happening across all these different forms. So for the human class, the word woman originally ended in a short vowel, so now we have to fill in any of these three. 
Let's go with something like Nihir. Or actually, again, keep forgetting there's a glottal stop. Let's do Nihir. Okay, so those would be all of the protoforms. And now let's fire up Lexigy and see what we get. Okay, for the singulars, the first two are pretty basic and intuitive. The third one, it's interpreting the Y that comes from the I as being in a cluster with N, so it's erroneously inserting an epithetic vowel. But if we discount that, that's also pretty straightforward. And with the last one, again, it's imagining this ow diphthong as sticking around and manifesting as a coda W, which I do not think will be the case. Okay, for the dual, it's being strange again. I don't really understand how it's ending up with these forms. For the nominative, the Y would just disappear, and we can get away with chopping off the A as well, and in fact, pretty sure that W would just assimilate straight into the front rounded vowel. So, Niri. Okay, with a little bit of finessing, we get these. Not bad, except I'm not a huge fan of Nirwirli. Moving on to the plurals. Oh dear, should have seen that coming. Lots of R's going on. It's all right, but I think actually what might make it better is if we change the R in the protoform to an L. So, Ni'il. There we go, much better. And actually, I think we can afford to do one more noun. It is New Year's after all, we can afford to go a little bit long. But for the sake of simplicity, I think it's going to have to be an inanimate. Specifically, an inanimate ending in either a nasal or a liquid. How about a word for water? But actually, specifically, still water. Because running water is likely to be animate. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Well, I'm pretty certain just water, the substance, will be inanimate. How about something just like Tilan? That's simple enough. Or actually, how about Rilan? Sounds slightly better. And it reminds me of Margaret Ransell Green's Conlang Rilin. So those then would be our protoforms. Now that's interesting. The G in the inanimate class ending disappears intervocalically, but when it's next to another consonant, it turns into a voiced palatal stop, which ultimately turns into a Z and then a R. I don't know why it's saying the stress is on the first syllable for this second form. It should be Rilinin. That dative form, Rilinrur, I feel like we could maybe justify having one of the R's in the final syllable disappear. It just feels a little bit clunky as it is. But first, let's have a look at the singulars, which by the way, this is one of the reasons why I love singulatives, because water typically will be a mass noun, but if you have a singulative, like we essentially have in this language, although it's been reanalyzed kind of as basically being just a default singular. But essentially, these forms mean one unit of water, whereas these just mean water in general. This final form isn't great, but I think we can actually pretty easily justify haplology there, where the second r syllable just disappears. So like rilinrus, and I'm going to use that same excuse to justify cutting the data down to just rilinra. And you know what? While we're here, just for the hell of it, let's also make the animate version of the word for water as well, because we already have the protoform for it. Just a matter of swapping out the inanimate class marker for the animate one to make a word that means a source of running water, or I guess a flow, or a current, or something like that. Yep, those all check out, except for that last one because I changed my mind about the rounding harmony, I'm just having it go from front to back. The duel is once again doing something very strange. Should really look into that. That's looking a bit better. Remember we said that T is going to disappear in the nominative, but when the syllable is stressed, it becomes a D. You know, I just realized I had this in the wrong spot. The root ends in a nasal, so it should be up here which means we now have two different animate nouns that end in nasals. I mean, that's fine. Just gives us more opportunities to compare the different forms. Okay, I've added those two forms to the dictionary, and now I really have to put my foot down because this one has been going on for ages. So join me next time when we continue to work on verb morphology.
and finish straightening out those applicatives, and maybe going into the causative and some other stuff, we'll see. So thank you once again very much for watching, and Happy New Year!